So here it is, mid-June already. Half of 2024 is already written in history. So the past few years, for me at least, I've felt like instead of 12 months, there's four. May, or March, June, September, and December. And maybe that's why we have four seasons. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Or maybe you see the seasons as planting, planting, growing, and harvesting. We have that, uh, we don't have that planning part in our tagline, but it's a pretty important season, the season of making decisions of what or where we believe God is leading us. It can be compared to the seasons. Although like our unpredictable weather these days, we tend to skip around in the seasons of faith. It seems as though it should be fairly straightforward. We grow up learning about God, then we make a decision to be baptized and join the church to be part of the body of Christ. We continue growing our faith and spreading the gospel to others, and eventually we harvest a sense of peace in this life and life after. But that's not the way it always works, and it's not reality for most people. It tends to skip around all over the seasons of faith. We have times when we're hearing God's word and feel that it makes sense, that God is among us, rooting for us and loving us always, especially if we've grown up in the church. Or maybe, especially because we've grown up in the church, we don't, depending on your experience. And other times when we feel abandoned and as though we have to make our own way in the world. Times when the idea of taking it to God in prayer is the last thing we think to do. We even may have times when we wonder if God even exists. So this series has been about going back to basics. Remembering who God is. The God that is always with us. The omnipresent. The God who knows all the omniscient. And today we'll talk about the almighty and all-powerful God. Our lectionary scripture today continues in Samuel's life. Samuel's been told by God that since the people had insisted on a human leader and took God as their lead and took Saul as their leader, but don't confuse this Saul with the Saul in the New Testament. They're totally different people, just a really common name back then. It was time to go to pick out Israel's next leader. Samuel was afraid that Saul would kill him if he went to choose someone to replace him. God told Saul exactly what he was to do. Take a heifer to, the, to Bethlehem and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. God told Samuel that God would show Samuel what he should do. Now this shows how faithful that Samuel was because even though he feared Saul, Samuel was willing to listen to God and follow God's lead. Samuel didn't insist that God lay out the whole plan before him, before he followed God. Samuel just trusted. He believed in God's power to protect him. He was human though, so he may have been anxious or worried or even scared, but he moved forward and did what call, God called him to do. And God told Samuel that God would name the one that was to be anointed as the new leader. So Samuel did what God told him to do. He went to Bethlehem, but the elders of the city were a bit freaked out. They were worried that Samuel was there to stir things up. They were afraid that there would be war. So they asked, do you come peaceably? So they didn't just assume that Samuel wanted to rock the boat. They came and spoke to him and gave him a chance to explain himself. Samuel said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then Samuel invited them to come along. He invited Jesse and his sons to come to the sacrifice as well. There are two words that I'd like for us to keep in the back of our minds for another time. Sacrifice and sanctified. But we've got a whole different lesson today, so we'll come back to those words in the near future. So from the beginning, Samuel stayed calm, and then he asked people to join him. He wasn't one to storm in and take over. 
He brought people alongside him as he served God. Being filled with the confidence that God had sent him, Samuel could have strolled into town and just said, Hey, God sent me. God said, I'm the one. I'm the one who's going to choose the next leader. But he didn't. Because Samuel knew that he was not the one with the power. It was God that held all the power. God would be choosing the next leader, not Samuel. And remember, God had told Samuel that the leader would be found in Jesse's family. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. This verse and the next confirm that if it were left to Samuel, he would have chosen the person who seemed, based on appearance, based on human thought and ideas, Samuel would have chosen Jesse's son, Eliab, for this new leader, because Eliab apparently looked the part. But God could see into Eliab's heart. God, remember, God knows all. And God knew that Eliab was not the best choice. God reminded Samuel, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. Boy, how often do we think that we know better. We think something's obvious. So we don't stop to ask God's opinion first. We don't take it to prayer. So once Samuel rejected Eliab, Jezzy called for Abinadab and then Shammah. And he didn't say, no, this isn't the one. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one each time. So he's being clear that this isn't his own choice, that he is listening for God to choose. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So all seven sons passed before Samuel, with each being rejected by God as the new leader. So Samuel says, is that it? Are these all of your sons? And Jesse, who must have not thought that leaving David out would make a difference, said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping sheep. So it's almost as if he's discounted David as an option, and at the same time, giving an excuse as to why Samuel shouldn't bother considering David. Basically, he's just the youngest, and he's busy. Did Jesse think so little of his youngest son, or did he just want to protect his youngest from being put into what could be a dangerous situation? We aren't told, but Samuel didn't give him an out. Samuel insists, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Now, you all know what that's like. I know you breathe a sigh of relief when we sit down after just standing during the call to worship, the opening hymn, and the prayer. But Samuel wasn't just talking about making people continue standing versus sitting. Sitting down in this particular instance had to do with sitting down and relaxing, having a meal together, drinking some wine, and celebrating that Samuel's been able to locate the next leader and that it's been found amongst Jesse's family. That's what he meant by sitting down. We aren't going to put this matter to rest until I get to see David. Jesse sent for David and brought him before Samuel, and lo and behold, God said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. This is the one. What an exciting moment that must have been for everyone. Samuel was probably relieved to have this task done to God's liking. And what father wouldn't be proud? Jesse's son had been chosen, and while siblings have been, had a history in the Bible of being jealous of one another, we don't hear anything of that sort at this point. Samuel anointed David in front of his family, and it says that from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. 
Now, if you recall, if you follow the life and times of David, David's spiritual growth wasn't linear from that point on. David was like the rest of us. David went through different seasons of faith, some pleasing to God and some not so much. But still, overall, David became known as a great leader. Not a perfect human being, but a great leader. But David was never God. David was an instrument of God. David may have developed skills and been given gifts that cause him to become more powerful in the world, but David never became more powerful than God. God remains all-powerful. Even a person like David, who really was quite remarkable, could not compare to God. Even a person who holds <clears throat> worldly power and who loves God, even that person doesn't hold a candle to God's power. But here's the thing. <coughs> Excuse me. God doesn't use the power God holds to intimidate, to threaten, to force people. Remember, Jesus was called the Prince of Peace. Remember, God gives humanity freedom, free will. That's a particular type of power we get to choose. We may not get to choose all the things in our lives that we wish that we could choose, but we do get to choose how we behave, how we react, and how we allow God to work through us. It's not always easy. We have to have both willpower and self-restraint at times. It takes willpower and sometimes self-restraint to make choices that we believe to be God's will. God loves us. God knows each of us and loves us anyway, right? God loves us. God can be anywhere at any time and chooses to be at our sides all of the time. And God's power is reflected many times through the body of Christ, through God's church. It's through God's power that Herbst has existed these past 141 years. Not as we sometimes like to think, through human power. God could have brought storms and wiped out the buildings, financial woes and disharmony that wiped out all of the members, if that's what God wished to happen to this church that's what would have happened. We and others may have felt that there have been close calls in the past, possibly, but as of today, that hasn't happened. And that's God's power. Herps was just honored for some of God's work that we've been doing, but we know that a lot more is happening than money being sent to missions or outreach done in the community or the caring that's done between people. As we listen for God's will and follow that will, we know that God's spirit is at work within this church. We experience examples of God's presence, God's knowing, and God's power in our lives every day. The Holy Spirit is at work within our minds and hearts and of those people which we come into contact. God's almighty power is at work in my life in your life, and in the life of this church. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that we have seen your glory and goodness this week. We're thankful for each day that you give us. But life isn't perfect because we aren't perfect. Help us to listen to your call as Samuel did. Going forward, even when we're not sure of ourselves, let us have faith in you. Give us courage to unite together to spread the gospel by the words we speak and by our actions. May we notice those around us and how we might best serve you. When we do that, let it be with joyful hearts and for your glory. At times, there's nothing a human can do, and that can leave us hopeless. But we know that you have the power that we lack. So may we be reminded to lay those instances at your feet and be at peace that you can heal our bodies and our communities. 
You can heal our souls and you can heal our world. And hear us now as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go into our week, let us remember that God goes with us and just how great God is. And let us remember that we look to God as our Father. And may he bless all of the fathers in our lives. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.